Hi, good morning. My name is Mary Picon. I'm the publisher of Teal's Press. Um, it's always an honor for me to do a welcome each year. Um, it's, it really is incredible that um, we are here at the NYU Dolce House. Uh, Juliana Cranfield was unable to be here to do her welcome, but she's uh, she sends her very best and a successful weekend. Um, we have um, a few things. Um, I'll, I'll have some housekeeping announcements throughout the day. Uh, if there's any questions about anything on the program, I'll be in the foyer. Feel free to ask. Uh, so without further ado, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming, specifically our keynote speakers, uh, Catherine Miladu, thank you very much, and um, also Reverend uh, Eugene Rivers will be here later in the day. So I would like to thank David Penn and Adrian Babs for putting a, an incredible program together, and without further ado, I will welcome the next speaker, David Penn. Uh, our editor of the journal Teos now. So congratulations and have a fantastic conference. I'd just like to, to welcome everybody to the conference. Um, so um, I, um, the, the idea here is basically you know, we're going to start uh, with a discussion of mutual aid the conference. And I'm hoping that uh, a lot of these um, presentations can eventually be uh, Transformed into essays for the journal. So um, please uh, uh, think about that as you're, as you're discussing, as, as you're thinking about your own contributions. Um, you know, right now, you know, the uh, you know, I think we're doing a lot of exciting things for the journal. We're gonna, we just came out with our uh, uh, basically, I guess you could say, the conference volume from. Uh, it was, yeah, I it, was, uh, it, was, it was actually two years ago, but it's the Constitution of Theory. Uh, as cultural problem issues, and that just came out. Uh, and uh, we're preparing a new issue that will be coming out soon uh, about uh, economy and ecology. Uh, that'll be the next issue, which will be another month or so before, uh, before it's available. And so uh, we're really excited about the things we're doing right now. Um, and I'd like to just introduce now Adrian Pabst, uh, editor, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> director of the, uh, of the Institute, of the Institute Thanks very much, David. Well, um, very good morning for me, and can I have my very warm welcome? It's wonderful to see so many uh, friends and colleagues, old and new. Uh, I think someone once said a successful conference is when you, you know, see a friend uh, again and make at least uh, one new friend, and that I think is very much the spirit of these conferences. They are, as you know. Uh, small in terms of numbers, but we I think, pride ourselves rightly on being very collegiate, friendly, um, uh, you know, hosting for our conferences. And uh, it's wonderful that we have both very loyal friends who come back year after year, but also new faces. And so we very much look forward to this edition, which I have to say uh, I had less involvement with because David was still setting up the conference team and the program, and so I'm very grateful to him for all that work. Uh, he, as you know, has moved on to becoming the editor of the journal, and I have taken over as the director of the Institute. But really, we work closely together in terms of these events, because the Institute hosts them, but we hope that, as David has already said, a lot of the papers will go into the journal. Uh, we may also do a book. You know, all of this will be decided once we get your uh, written material after the conference. Before uh, we start with the panel, maybe just two words on the conference. One is that we're very interested at TELOS in the whole space between, on the one hand, the individual, and on the other hand, the state and the market, especially at the level of the central, federal state, you might say, or the global market. So a lot of the institutions that actually mediate between are the sort of institutions that we're interested in, that we think have been neglected or forgotten by a lot of the dominant models. Um, and we're also interested in exile traditions, traditions that haven't been so dominant, uh, but that are important for our understanding and for thinking uh, through what something like mutual aid might, might mean going forward. And I think mutualism is one such exile tradition, and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear a lot from uh, the various papers about just that. 
The second thing to say is that the Institute um, is also able this year for the first time, we're very proud of this, to give everyone who has signed up uh, for the conference uh, some books as a token of our appreciation of your participation. So we will uh, find a way to get them to you. We're not entirely sure yet how, but we have lots of copies. So everyone will be getting a copy of The New Class Conflict, which is a book we published by Joel Cochran, uh, I think it was in 2018. Uh, or possibly the year before that. Um, then we've got uh, Mastering the Past on Central and Eastern Europe and the Rise of Illiberalism by Alan Hinsey, and also essays published by Alain de Benoit over many decades in Telos entitled Democracy and Populism, and what could be more topical than those, uh, those three books. So we will give them to you as the day unfolds. Uh, and that's really something that we're, we're very keen to do for you to be able to read up and then hopefully also uh, reference these books in, in your work. Mary, just, just to clarify, the books uh, that we're giving out are for the paid participants from TILOS. Uh, what we are going to offer for the folks who uh, registered through the Deutsche House, we will offer a 30% discount on the books. If you're interested, and you can see me outside, and we can certainly, you know, arrange for payment, uh, etc. So I just want to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you uh, again uh, very much for being here. And so why uh, don't we um, sort of seamlessly transition to the first session, which is on foundations of mutual aid? And can I call the speakers to come and sit at the front? And they are Marsha Pally, Wayne Hudson, Joseph Penderski, and David Hansen. Please just. Okay, let's see if you're ready. Thank you very much, Mary. <laughs> and yeah, before we start, uh, may I also add a, a huge word of thanks to Mary and her team because there's so much work going on behind the scenes for these events to take place and to be success. So we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Mary. To Rob is also in the foyer, to uh, Jennifer, who will uh, hopefully join us uh, later today. So um, I think that's really important. And the hospitality has always been, I think, one of the key features of our yeah, conference. Yeah. So, Mary, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, so it gives me a great pleasure in introducing the first panel on Foundations of Mutual Aid. Um, and I think we'll just take the papers as they are announced in the program, in that order, which is not an alphabetic one, uh, and hence makes it more, uh, uh, perhaps more uh, uh, curious. So we will start with a paper by Marsha Pally, who's a professor at New York University, and the paper's entitled Mutualistic Understanding of Humanity's Baseline. May I just say that we have um, basically set this up in such a way that papers are 15 minutes, Right, so that we have ample time for discussion uh, afterwards. And what I'd like to do is, in this panel at least, to take one or two questions, maybe of clarification or sort of brief elaboration after each paper, right? but then also have enough time at the end to touch on some of the things that may pertain to more than one. Okay, so please do put up your hands when you have a question to our speakers. Uh, but 15 minutes is what we'd like to limit the presentations to so that we have enough discussion time, okay, this is true for this panel and, and for the rest. So, Marcia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, David, and thank you, Mary and Absentia, and uh, thanks to all the entire team that put together the conference so that we could all be here. Thank you for being here on this frigid morning and making a wonderful pretense of being awake, which I am not quite. Um, this, uh, this paper is uh, truly foundational, something like a prolegomena to discussions of mutualistic aid. Um, so I'll just plunge in. Um, on human thriving, the neurobiologist Dacian Aldeas writes, to approach eudaimonia or human flourishing, one must have a concept of human nature, a realization of what constitutes a normal baseline. That is, one needs to know uh, humanity's nature, its ontology, to create conditions for its well-being. Aristotle said much the same. The nature of the thing is its end in the book on politics. To understand the nature of the thing is to understand its end, its specific form of flourishing. 
So what is the human baseline? So that we may develop an economics and politics and public policy to suit. The Christian and Judaic traditions propose that our baseline is relational, mutualistic. And it seems the sciences are finally catching up. Not I as the neurobiologist, too, holds that the human baseline is relational. There is, she writes, no being without shared social relations. Physicist Carlo Rovelli writes, all things are continually interacting with one another, and in doing so, each bears the traces of that with which it has interacted. In this presentation, I'll begin with mutualism as expressed in Covenant and Trinity, and turn to recent science on human hyper-cooperativity as a baseline or framework for economics and politics. What is relationality? Drawing from the Judaic, Christian, and Neoplatonist traditions, it begins with the idea that being, all existence, results from the source of all there is. There could be nothing, but there's something. The source of all something is what some people call God. Uh, I'm particularly fond of the Kabbalist Ein Sof uh, and his idea that God is not so much what precedes existence or effects, but what is realized as it realizes effects or yields effects. On one hand, each particular being is radically different from structure and cause, God, differences in materiality and immateriality, finitude, infinitude. Yet on the other hand, each particular partakes of the structure and cause in order to exist at all. The difference, yet partaking or relation, is the way anything comes to be. The structure of existence is difference amid relation. In Aquinas' words, in all things God works intimately. As difference amid relation is the structure of existing, not only are persons distinct from God, yet in intimate relation with him, we are also distinct from each other, and yet in necessary relation. Each of us is distinct with unique talents and value, Yet, quote, the individual is a fact of existence insofar as he steps into a living relation with other individuals, as Martin Buber wrote. Relationality <coughs> as distinction amid relation is not binary between distinction on one hand and relation on the other. It is reciprocal constitution. Each becomes the singular person she is through the layers and networks of relations, beginning with those near and continuing with those that extend out in our paths of global connectedness, as our educational and economic opportunities, stresses, nutrition, healthcare, are formed by people who are not necessarily geographically close. Trinity is a wonderful expression of this idea. Each Trinitarian person is distinct, yet the identity of each is given by the other Trinitarian persons. Edith Stein, the German Jewish philosopher who became a discalcid Carmelite sister, notes that the persons of the Trinity, for the persons of the Trinity, I am, is identical with I am one with you, or we are. As we partake of this triune God to exist at all, we partake of this distinct persons in community. The imago is triune, community. Each person in the image of this relation with God becomes who she distinctly is through given, giving and being given to. A second expression of relationality is covenant, a bond between distinct parties where each party gives to the flourishing of the other. Unlike contract, which protects interests, covenant protects relationship. Covenant begins dyadically between God and Adam, God and Noah, yet does not remain dyadic. Persons give to God also by giving to others, hektesh in Hebrew. These relations of giving are mutually constitutive. Covenantal commitment to others co constitutes covenant with God, and covenant with God sustains us in covenantal commitment with others. We find this, for example, in the Ten Commandments, the first three of which pertain to God, and the rest seamlessly to relations among other persons. Covenant, reciprocal commitment, thus extends from dyad to larger human associations. Gift exchange networks, as described by Marcel Mauss, for example, where gift from God to person 
generates gift from person to person and on to the next person, not back to the original, on to the next person through the giving loop, thus sustaining it. Who's in the loop? The biblical answer is all the nations. God covenants with Adam, all humanity, with Noah, and with the three patriarchs, quote, for the blessing of all the nations. Covenant is among the central precepts undergirding the extensive biblical and rabbinic obligations to the enemy, stranger, and domestic poor. What do the signs say? Evolutionary biology and psychology identify Homo sapiens as a, quote, hyper-cooperative species. Cooperative behaviors, quote, are associated with disadvantage or cost for the actor and benefit for the recipient, close quote, that is, with reciprocal giving. While evolutionary pressures, to be sure, yielded episodic aggression and opportunistic rating were advantageous, cooperativity and egalitarianism, including communal property and communal child rearing, along with robust fairness and sharing norms, <coughs> Were the modern hunter-gatherer modus uh, vivendi for 250,000 or more years. This cooperativity was critical not only for the public arenas of goods exchange, but for the species' cognitive and emotional social development. Cooperativity begins in the playful copying and exchange of gestures and facial expressions between human infants and their kin and non-kin caretakers. This back and forth, it <coughs> yields, quote, a unified common subjective space with a wide variety that even infants know are different from themselves. Each stage of cognitive and emotional growth is grounded in this interaction between baby and other to arrive at what Sarah Hurdy calls emotional modernity, the capacity to grasp <coughs> and coordinate with the attention of others, the intention of others, and the emotions of others in order to sustain relationships through, one, through which one feels safe and learns about the world. Importantly, this relating generalizes to those outside the kin group. Michael Tomasillo adds that joint attention and intention created the basis for role reversal and recursive thinking. Recursive thinking is the understanding that I know that you know, that you want me to know, that I know, etc. Um, role reversal and recursive thinking allows complex and importantly collaborative endeavors. He writes, the key novelties in human evolution were adaptations for an especially cooperative, indeed hyper-cooperative way of life. In addition to the psychological argument, Biology, too, notes that homo sapiens evolved towards substantial hyper-cooperativity. Overall, Richard Wrangham writes, physical aggression in humans happens at less than 1% of the frequency among any of our closest relatives. We are really a dramatically peaceful species. You bet. Put 250 chimps in a plane for nine hours, and you will have a massacre, not complaints about the choice of movies. Benefits of cooperativity included improved food gathering, protection from animal predators, and other collaborative projects, as well as more equitable food distribution, <coughs> yielding greater longevity for more people and a greater chance at reproduction. The primatologist Franz Duval writes, we owe our sense of fairness to a long history of mutualistic cooperation, not just with kin. Friction between groups may have occurred, of course, more frequently, owing to less need for cooperativity and thus a lower bar um, to uh, oh, opportunistic rating. While this is possible, Claire et al. find, quote, no conclusive evidence for intergroup writing in the early, early pre-pottery Neolithic, 10,000 to 8,000 BCE. And they warn of the bellicosification of prehistory. Little of the fossil evidence can be identified as systemic, rather than episodic, group or intergroup aggression. Kissel and Kim, in their important overview of the literature, note that such fossil signatures are insufficient to indicate violence, much less organized violence between groups. 
They agree with such researchers as Keely Fry, Soberg, Briolkis, among others, that vast periods of the Holocene show, quote, virtually no signs of violent conflict intergroup. Indeed, among high cooperativity hunter-gatherers, shortages may have led to non-engagement or cooperation. For example, if hunter-gatherer bands battle each other to be the only ones to hunt an animal, the winner may end with more food, but many will be downed in the fight, the capacity to overpower the animal will be diminished, and the chances of becoming the animal's lunch rather than making it one's own increase. Cooperativity may be the better survival strategy. Similarly, if one group raids another's food cache, chances of retaliation are not trivial. Yet, Random notes, hunter-gatherers raid only when the, uh, when the risk is low of sustaining injury. Non-engagement was the more frequent strategy, and raiding would have been rare. In sum, David Barish finds that war is not genetically hardwired, but rather historically recent, erratic, quote, in worldwide distribution, and a capacity. Capacities are, quote, derivative traits that are unlikely to have been directly selected for, but have developed through cultural processes. Capacities are neither universal nor mandatory. Ferguson and Fry, among others, made a similar case that any shift from hypercooperativity with episodic aggression which would have been evolutionary adaptive for hundreds of thousands of years, any shift away from that would require explanation in specific changes in environmental and ecological conditions, what biologists call the competitive regime. Such a shift is recorded around 8,000 BCE, when we find not episodic aggression amid hypercooperativity, but the systemic practice of severe aggression, including endemic raiding and warfare, maiming, torture, capital punishment, impoverishment, imprisonment, and enslavement, both within the group and between the groups. What changes in competitive regime prompted the shift? The most persuasive evidence suggests the change from hunter gathering to sedentarism and agriculture, among the most significant changes in human development. With agrarianism came the radically new presence of surpluses and their monopolizability. One's neighbor's goods nearby as ever-present temptations. The new competitive regime incentivized small groups of elite, elite monopolizers who had substantial motive to grab what others possessed and to protect their cash by force, yielding hierarchy where there had been <coughs> egalitarianism. Joel Hodge notes a second prod, ironically in the new con uh, prod to aggression, in the new conditions of relative safety that came with agrarianism. While pre-agriculture fear of animal predation tended people towards cooperation, the relative security of population <clears throat> clusters surrounded by farmland decreased this worry and increased concern about neighbors who had motive to steal and um, aggressively protect their gains. Robert Bella describes a third prod to aggression in the temptation to take not only goods, but political and military power. While the first grabber takes resources, the next grabber wants two things, resources and the elite position in the hierarchy that the first grabber occupies. The societal results are substantial inequality, hierarchy, severe policing of domestic populations, and endemic, not episodic, raiding and warfare. Interestingly, Fry's study of present-day <clears throat> foragers found that hierarchical societies engaged in warlike activity, while mobile forager, foragers with egalitarian societies did not. To be sure, the shift to agrarianism and hierarchy violated long-evolved cooperativity that had been selected for for over 200,000 years. But the radical changes that agrarianism and sedentarism entailed may have been sufficient to violate it, to turn episodic aggression into systemic practice. Yet, in closing, 
perhaps a 250,000 year experience of hunter-gatherer hyper-cooperativity remains with us as a resource from which to construct mutualistic societies today, or at least more so than if humanity had never lived under such hyper-cooperativity. There is some argument that cooperativity is contingent on the physical proximity and small size communities of pre-modern living. But it's interesting that today, toddlers do not strike out even at stranger children. 18-month-olds reach out to assist stranger adults, and children as young as three will disobey instructions likely to lead to harming others. Perhaps cooperativity is with us still as a ground for a more mutualistic organization of resources and mutualistic structuring of even capitalist markets. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marsha. Uh, a short history of 200,000 years of cooperativity. Uh, In under 15 minutes. <laughs> wow, I mean, that, that's more debatable, but uh, it, was, it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, crucially, a great start to the panel. Are there any questions of clarification or brief elaboration that anyone would like to raise to Marsha directly before we move on to the next? You are all very patient very attentive. No immediate questions. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Marcia. It was very interesting to say, but I wonder if selfishness or egoism is not the problem rather than aggressivity or aggression? Because many biologists have shown that, in fact, cooperation or mutual, mutualism could be just masks for selfishness. Like if I think of Dawkins, like the selfish gene, and the kind of strategy, and that sometimes cooperation can just be the pretense. Yeah. So, so I've been looking into this for quite a number of years. Dawkins is not taken seriously. The selfish gene is not taken seriously. Uh, modern biologists or evolutionary and developmental psychologists. Um, the human cognitive as well as emotional development as well as societal organization for hundreds and thousands of years was far more reliant uh, on the presence of, of not cooperativity but really substantial hyper cooperativity and mm -hmm. fairness and sharing norms. Um, the claim uh, would be actually we would not have the human brain that we have without hundreds of thousands of years of selection. Um, based on uh, hi highly cooperative living. Um, and the selfish gene is, is just not taken seriously in the people who are doing research um, on this. Um, so that it's not a mass, but rather the foundation. And, if you, and the, other, the evidence we have of pre-agrarian living is not of people straining at the um, aggressive, selfish people straining at the bit to get out of cooperative societies, but of in fact cooperative societies that had been selected for and fantasy sharing norms that had been internalized. So the the um, there there are debates within the field, but not about that. Right. Thank you very much. I think we'll unless there's another question. I think we'll move on to the next. Oh, there will be a chance at the end of the session. So our next speaker is uh, Wayne Hudson from Charles Sturt University, as well as the Australian National University. And his paper is on Fichte, Marx, and Mutualism. Wayne, not, not really, Edwin. It's about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've done something I never, ever do. I've written the whole paper out, and I'm not going to read it. But I am going to follow Marx here, but in a different mode, so you have to change lens a little bit now, saying not different things exactly, but in a different spirit. A little bit picking up on Catherine's intervention, because I don't believe in social trinitarianism, and I think monotheism is the greatest rubbish ever put forward in the history of the world, and has no basis in the Old and New Testament. Now, I can argue that to you with the latest scholarship and the latest archaeology. There is no evidence for monotheism in the Old or the New Testament, and there is absolutely no truth in the idea that the truth is behind us. 
So my critique of what we've said so far is that it's no use adopting monotheistic stuff, updating it into social Trinitarian form, and then treating the sciences, and here I follow Nietzsche, as though they were some sort of anterior real. There is no reality behind us that solves our problems. Otherwise, we fall into the Darwinian mess all over again, only this time it's happy. Instead of nature, red, and truth, and it's cooperative. Well, that's lovely. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is something quite different, but it does support Marcia's argument in the end. So uh, our war will end in happiness and peace. And that also supports her main point, I think. Mean. Uh, what I'm going we to do is... love each other. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is a bit uh, different in style and temper, but you'll get the point. I'm just going to offer you a minorian resurrection of three people very quickly and draw the implications for our conference. The first one will be very quick because I didn't even include it in the abstract. We need to remember Altius, the great pol political philosopher between Baudin and Hobbes, the great Calvinist political philosopher. Please notice, not Carl Schmitt, the Catholic fascist, not the fascism of the Roman church, not popes proposing Roman authoritarianism as the basis of law, but the great Calvinist revolutionary thinker, Altius. And what Altius does is propose a complete demolition of modus theories of sovereignty and the, a whole model for how to structure a commonwealth on federalist, pluralist principles, preserving the medieval Catholic Church's enlightened teaching of subsidiarity, but absolutely rejecting the core evil that sovereignty can be ever located in anyone in a modest, absolutist form. I won't go on the rest of Altius because you'll see how revolutionary and fun that is. I stole quite a lot of it from Alain Benoit, who has a very good essay on this important topic, but you get the message. We need to look away from Schmidt. We need to look away from Verdun. We need to look at how people struggling to survive Catholic tyranny were driven to develop a different kind of political theory against Catholic kings. And if you think I'm extreme, uh, Protestant extremists will know I'm Catholic. That's not <laughs> okay. Now, the second person I want to talk about is Karl Marx, and that's going to take 700 years, but I've got about six minutes. Uh, I'm going to tell you only about four things, but you won't know them, I hope. In which case, I won't waste your time. You probably do know that the whole of Marx's works were faked by the Russians and the East Germans, and that the Marx you know about is not Karl Marx at all. It's a terrible sham. They faked the text, they took out sentences, they add text sentences. We're now getting the whole thing again in 125 volumes. And what is important is we're getting for the very first time 125 of Marx's notebooks, 31 volumes we've never seen before, which are about Marx's uh, resurrection of 19th century science and his anticipation of the Anthropocene and his development of a concrete model of eco-socialism grounded in the science of his time. The implication, of course, is that it's useless, like everything else Marx wrote, but we would be very <laughs> foolish to ignore the point. Because the underlying point, of course, is that Marx really did attempt to understand what had gone wrong in social and economic evolution and developed an account of that. The place to look for that is not in Capital, which, of course, was faked by Engels, including the title, including whole passages taken out, including passages put in, not in any of the works of the Marxists, which are all subnormally stupid, but in the Grundrisse. And if you read the Grundrisse, and you do need good German to do that thoroughly, you'll see that Marx, and this supports very strongly where Marx was going, was to his dying day. Not only the student of Greek philosophy, who argued for the philosophy of freedom in the structure of matter, little learned society, in the very structure of matter, but a negative social theologian. Now, unlike Marcia, I don't imply a view of religion or theism, like calling someone a theologian, but I do mean by a negative social theologian, someone who has a very profound pathology of what human beings get wrong and why under specific historical now, if you've followed all that so far, you'll realize we have a new Marx, not the Marx of Engels, not the Marx of Marxism. The new Marx is, I'm going to give two characterizations, but we'll see where it goes. He's clearly a, a, a revolutionary conservative. And that's all through the text, page after page after page. He's clearly an idealist, materialist, realist. That's been known for a long time. It was new by, known by de Boren in Russia, which is why Stalin murdered him. But it means that everything we've been told is fundamentally mistaken because Marx does think that the answer is already developing in the concrete reality of the world. It's in the letter to Ruger, dream of the thing, Zarka, Troy of the Zarka. Zarka's untranslatable into English, but you get the feel of it. It's a revolutionary. 
and so to thesis. The second thing that you do get in Marx, particularly in the Grundrisse, is an extremely profound account of how human freedom and individuality is perverted when social relations are converted into relations between things. That's his central point. And notice that it's a moral point. Notice that he has a strong doctrine of natural law. Notice that he's scholastic in logic, not modernist in logic. And notice finally, and most important of all, that it ends up in a vision of a society in which there will, for the very first time, be free individuals. So Marx, if you like, is the greatest liberal the world has ever seen. And unlike Adrian, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> now, I'm causing trouble. And you see the style, and you know it would go down better in Paris than it would in Rome. But never mind. I've got to do it with Fichte, because this is less well known to you. Now, I can't do the whole of Fichte in six seconds. But I will, because I have no more time. Fichte influenced Marx. This is on Feuerbach, it's profoundly influenced by Victor. Marx's vision of what will happen in the future is profoundly influenced by Victor. So if we look to Victor again, what do we find? Well, we find again that the Anglo-Saxons have made a total hash of it as usual. Not just Americans, Anglo-Saxons generally make a hash of German thought, and a terrible mess of Marx, a terrible mess of Hegel. Look at Brandon's new book, if you want an example. 900 pages of nonsense. Uh, and have a look at the literature on Victor, it's terrible. There are 250 monographs in German on Fichte, and no one in the Anglo-Saxon world, including me, has read them. All right, well, what does Fichte do? You know he writes the Wissenschaft Lehrer. What you may not know is he leaves 27 different versions, and they're all different from each other. And he tries in all of them to say that everything depends on intellectual intuition. You throw your hand up and say, what is it? He doesn't know. And he spends thousands of pages trying to say, and he doesn't know. So what is the importance of Fichte? The importance of Fichte is, I think, that Fichte sees that it's possible to reconstruct ancient noetic on social principles in a praxeological form and use this as a basis for a rational society which will be based entirely on vocative social life. Now, here's the link suddenly appearing to mutualism. But I don't pull it out of the nature of biology, thank you, happy. I don't pull it out of uh, the so-called Jewish-Christian tradition, which I don't think ever existed. I don't do that. I pull it out of the essential thesis of Fichte that if you can perform the social noetic in the way he indicates, you will arrive at an account of transcendental philosophy which will be the only account that can make our view of the world coherent. Now, Victor is, of course, an extremely nasty rationalist person. But the thing you have to hear him saying is that if you don't adopt transcendental philosophy of a hard sort, your view of the world will be irrationalist. The moment the West is falling apart because our view of the world is irrational doesn't prove that Kick is right, but he has a serious alternative because what we've chosen to think instead leaves us without a proper account of rational agency and a meaningless universe. Victor has a way out of the abyss. I don't suggest it's correct for a moment, but I suggest that it's extremely important because it enables us to found social thought not only in Finnish social ontology, as we must do, but also in an account of the vocative. And the account of the Vokati is stronger than any kind of wishy-washy process philosophy relationality theory, which refuses to hierarchize relationality and therefore can't explain anything. It is a stronger account of the Vokati has to be in terms of call. It has to be the Vokari in a very, very strong sense. And Victor shows how to develop an ethics based on that, not the American interpretation, which is that he's a kind of American Hegel, but it's all about recognition of something like that, of the social constitution of the self. No, 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 no. It's about absolute vocative core and the meaning that has for a rational account of the universe. Now, I'm going to very quickly tell you what he says about that and play one short trick on the way home. The short trick is crucial. Uh, when we wrote about Fichte or read Fichte, we didn't understand what Fichte meant. Now, there's now an absolutely brilliant book by an Australian, I'm proud to say, on Fichte's philosophy of mathematics. And what he shows is that the Wissenschaftslehrer is the Mathesis of Mathesis. So if you haven't got Victor's philosophy of mathematics, you can't read it, which is why you went to sleep on page three. If you add his philosophy of mathematics, you see that Victor is actually saying something technical, difficult, demanding, yes, but with revolutionary implications. And these revolutionary implications are roughly these. Because we are plastic beings, personally and social, because we are in a universe in which the reality is not behind us, because technology is transforming us for good and evil, we have to develop a protective moral metaphysics or the human being will be destroyed. That's the Fichtean claim. We have to develop a moral metaphysics or the human being will be destroyed. It's important because that's also the main thesis of Chinese philosophy for the last 200 years. 
I can take you all through one young Ming, and all of those people you've heard about, the person you must read is Mo Zongzang, the greatest Chinese thinker for 150 years. And what is it? It's a response to Kant saying that Kant is wrong because we have intellectual intuition, presenting that not from German sources, but from Chinese. So we come back to this problem, what do you mean by intellectual intuition? I have no quick answer to that except to give you the following idea. That what Fichte is claiming is that a rational view of the world will include consciousness and subjectivity, will include an account of rational agency, will include account of transcendental necessity, and will also be able to theorize vocative call. Now, how could you theorize vocative call? This is my last point on Fichte, and then I'll really sit down. Uh, to do that, you have to do what Fichte does. You have to go to a again, a social theology. Now, all the English-speaking books, books in English on Fichte dismiss his last theology as some sort of madness, like they can't deal with the last theology of Schelling either, and like the Americans can't deal with Hegel's theology. I mean, Pippin wrote, what, 15 books arguing that he was an atheist and then found out that he had 18 proofs of the existence of God. Well, in the same way, Fichte ends his career as a theology. It's not a religious theology. It's not, the, not what people are talking about in churches, but it's the claim that the absolute is given as the content of the ich and as the content of freedom. So it is a social theology. It's transsubjective. It's not a form of theism. It's not a form of atheism. He's accused of both falsely. It's an account of how social meaning emerges in a way that can only be grasped through moral metaphysics. The central point of Fichte is that we become different beings depending whether we adopt a dogmatic or a non-dogmatic conception of reality. Everyone in this room is a dogmatist. Victor wants to convert you from dogmatism to what he calls practical idealism, which I would call awaking provocative reality. Now, if we awaken provocative reality, we can go back to Marx and say, well, wonderful work done by Marx in so many areas, but no real utopianism, because he's a utopian in the bad sense. He hasn't got a way to arrive at the kingdom of freedom. He hasn't got a path. And the path he does suggest, as we know, didn't work anyway. So if we want to come out of this little historical circle and go back to mutualism, what I'm suggesting is that mutualism does have a great deal to help us, but it needs to be understood in non-interior terms. I'm also suggesting that it needs to take account of moral metaphysics as the only possible way to arrive at a coherent view of reality which will form us as human beings. At the moment, the whole world is trying to form us as non-human beings using technology, and using a degraded science. Now, I'm as interested in science as, as uh, everyone else in this room, and I've written about that as well. But I don't think we should accept <coughs> modern science without rational critique. I don't think we should accept it without reviewing its stellar content. And I certainly don't think we should assume that anything is true because someone in the capitalist university says so in return for money. All right, so I end by saying there is a case for mutualism, but it requires stronger philosophical bases that any mutualist has. Stronger philosophical bases than an uncritical view of the sciences will give you. Philosophical bases that can't be the nonsense of monotheism. Philosophical bases that must, and this is my conclusion, return to the problem of Neoplatonism. And that's been a theme in both presentations. Because what the Neoplatonists got right, of course, was that we can ascend to the one. And that activity is more foundational than theories of being. Coming back to Fichte, you see the exact parallel. What Fichte is saying about the ich is not anterior as nonsense, but that we must begin with our own activity and not with the dogmatism of things. If we begin with our own activity and not a dogmatism of things, we can construct a moral metaphysics, which is formative and able to respond to our plasticity. If we do all of those things, we'll be very clever people indeed. Thank you. Questions to weigh. Mm -hmm. Wants to ask. Okay. Yes, I will open to the panel as well. Um, Marcia. Um, lovely brain. Just want to point out that Althusius, one of my favourite uh, 17th century characters, was a covenantal philosopher in the Bulliger line, not in the Calvin line. Um, and, there, and, and it is from Covenant that he located sovereignty, not in a person, certainly not in the monarch, Comte de Baudin, um, and very importantly was enabled to abstract value and practices from the person of the monarch right, um, to the transcendent level so that you could not tweak it to suit the reigning power. Yes. 
Peace be to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, David. Can you just repeat the name of the Chinese philosopher who wrote ah, Peter Kant? Yeah, that one's easy. M O U Mo Zung San. Z O N G S A N. He's the leading new Confucian philosopher. Z O N G S A N. Z-O-N-G. S-A-N. The wiki, there are articles on the web, wiki entries. Uh, he's one of the three main new Confucians, but he's the most important Chinese philosopher of the last 150 years. In a way, it's Wang Yang meaning again, it's the doctrine that relates to our conference. He argues that we have innate moral knowledge, and he argues that we can perceive moral truth. So it's a hard <coughs> argument about intellectual intuition. Of course, it doesn't mean perception in our sense. It's all muddled up with very sophisticated Sanskrit theories of Buddhism. I didn't go into for good and proper reason. When you first said that, you said Mao Zedong, but I didn't think that was. Well, Mao Zedong. I'm really, I'm relieved. Well, Mao Zedong was also, of course, a Buddhist logician. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Great, thank you uh, very much. Uh, we turn to our third uh, paper this morning by Joseph uh, Bandarski of Virginia Commonwealth University, and the paper's on Gustave Le Bon's Crowd Psychology and Historical Caution in the Midst of Contemporary pursuit of neuroscience as a path to new social policies. Joe. Yes. After listening to the first two papers, especially uh, Marsha's, I realized I should have changed the title to read not only sort of neuroscience, but also evolutionary psychology. All right. And thank you uh, for setting the stage for me, Marsha. And I'm sorry about what I have to say. I didn't know your paper. All right. Uh, in, a, in an age in which uh, astounding scientific discoveries impress us on an almost daily basis, right to this morning, uh, I detect, uh, in my own mind, a, a worrisome reversion to deferring to scientific authority in human relations. Such concerns are often perceived as unnecessarily alarmist. Uh, there is, we are assured, little if any chance of a resurgence of the authoritative scientism of the 19th century, particularly its long refuted social Darwinist variant. Mm -hmm. There are, of course, major debates regarding the benefits and dangers of genetic engineering every day. Yeah. Yet increasingly, discoveries in neuroscience, neuropsychology, and evolutionary psychology are discussed as the cutting edge in the future study of human society including the fields of philosophy and even the course of human history itself. Although such scientific advances in neuropsychology and other so-called hard sciences are undeniable, uh, the prospect of these somehow leading with teleological certainty in a positive historical direction is quite disturbing to me as a student of history. For it was this certainty and confidence that was at the very heart of the earlier positivist progressive scientism. By exploring the crowd psychology of the father of social psychology, Gustav Le Bon, my paper will provide, I hope, a necessary cautionary historical perspective about where such deference to science as a source of social understanding and policy can lead. Le Bon had a mutually reinforcing relationship with 19th century positivism and scientism. Living between 1841 and 1931, he was both a product of that scientism and a major contributor to it. He was a prolific writer whose work exhibited tremendous thematic breadth. And this extended from human cultural and biological evolution to those warning of the catastrophic worldwide revolt of inferior Asiatic and African races. He wrote a critique of the feminine tendencies in modern society, and even a work on the psychology of the horse. His reputation, however, and enduring impact, rested mostly with a study of the psychology of crowds, which extended into various works later on the psychology of socialism, and the psychology of evolution. <clears throat> the Harvard sociologist Gordon Alport called the Bones book on the crowd 
the most important book ever written in social psychology. With 50 French editions and translations into 16 foreign languages, the crowd ranks among the best-selling scientific books of all time. Although LeBron, LeBron's crowd psychology is still records today, its racial foundations usually are completely ignored if they're known at all. Perceiving himself as much as a natural scientist in the evolutionary tradition, as he was a social theorist, LeBron promoted what he called the law of the mental unity of crowds, mutualism. A crowd developed characteristics quite distinct from individuals composing it, just as individual biological cells unite to create a greater living organism different from their individual makeup. And the creation of a crowd, the intelligence, rationality, and even cultural effects of civilization in an individual succumb to the ever-present, though unconscious, instincts and passions inherent in each race. A kind of collective hypnosis takes control as the individual sacrifices his rationality and his rational self-interest to the collective interest. Losing his individual will in this emerging crowd, the individual descends down the ladder of civilization as he becomes a primitive creature acting on instinct. As part of this crowd, he can engage in violent, and ferocious behavior. But this situation can also unleash enthusiasm and heroism. Le Bon identified entire nations as crowds whose behavioral characteristics were determined primarily by their inherited racial traits. With racial traits dominant, tradition, education, institutions, environment, and even the distinctiveness of varying historical situations remain secondary influences. Speaking of the invisible soul of a race, LeBlanc wrote, our conscious acts are the outcome of an unconscious substratum created in the mind in the main by hereditary influences. This instinctual or subconscious substratum includes the shared moral, intellectual, and general psychological characteristics of a particular race. Thus, while certain national crowds are distinguished by their destruct destructive instincts, the crowd psychology of other nations motivates men to devotion and sacrifice in pursuit of lofty ideals of glory, honor, and patriotism. Heterogeneous crowds were inferior to homogeneous crowds. And relative to the question of mutual aid, LeBlanc determined that the more homogeneous the higher races were, uh, excuse me, the more homogeneous uh, the higher races were, the more likely they were to instinctively embody common sentiments that allowed for a sense of mutual interest and responsibility. Through such collective societal behavior, governmental policies would result that reflected and benefited their commonality. This explained the social progress of such races to higher planes of civilization, as well as their internal social stability. LeBlanc contrasted the heterogeneous Latin races with the homogeneous Anglo-Saxon races. Composed of different racial components, the French, Italians, Spaniards suffer from perennial dissension. Their history is thus one of perpetual political upheavals. Basically, they lack such sufficient instinctual spirit of commonality to act in their own mutual interest. Latin crowds are invariably more irritable, impulsive, and destructive than Anglo-Saxon crowds. They can be the most intolerant, dictatorial, and repressive. Unable to act individually in their common interest, Latins easily submit to authoritarian figures. LeBlanc detected the worst examples of the repercussions of such racial heterogeneity in the mixed races of Latin America, which always vacillated between anarchy and despotism. On the other hand, the homogeneous Anglo-Saxon races manifested the characteristics of willpower, 
energy initiative and self-control. Although the Anglo-Saxons cherished individual mindedness and personal liberty, they simultaneously had a highly developed collective soul with common sentiments, beliefs, and interests. These include a sense of duty and morality. They instinctively agree on the great questions of the day, as opposed to the Latins who always succumb to endemic dissension. The stability of the Anglo-Saxon nations does not emanate from their institutions. On the contrary, these institutions are themselves an outgrowth of the collective racial soul. If one were to apply Le Bon's own biological analogy, the disparate soul cells that compose Latin nations hinder their formation into a coherent larger organism with a common function and purpose. In contrast, the similarities of Anglo-Saxon cells allow them to retain their individuality while uniting into a larger organism functioning for the benefit of the whole. Yeah. Le Bon is postulating here a kind of mutual aid. But Le Bon's ideas on mutual aid are quite different than those of Peter Kropotkin. Both, of course, start with a naturalistic foundation and pursue or can perceive mutual aid, like the struggle for survival, as an evolutionary phenomenon. Okay. However, Kropotkin very confidently yeah, and hopefully perceives mutual aid as encouraging the societal trend away from struggle aggression, and towards cooperation among humans. Le Bon's conception is one in which the commonalities with their homogeneous national crowds do advance mutual interest rather than internal conflict. Nonetheless, for Le Bon, such internal cohesion, mutually recognized commonalities within one group, actually intensifies its struggle with other racial crowds. In fact, he bluntly stated that the Anglo-Saxon Americans triumphed by exercising their liberty according to the iron law of natural selection. The Americans retained their vitality and power by ignoring <coughs> pity and equality. Just a quote, a short quote, an excerpt from a longer disturbing one. Yeah. There is no room for the weak, the mediocre, the incapable on the soil of the United States. Inferior, isolated individuals or entire races are destined to perish. Today, Kropotkin might be more appealing than the law. But Kropotkin's appeal, like our disdain for the discredit of racial ideas of Lebon, does not necessarily make Kropotkin correct. And from a historical perspective, Lebon has proven far more influential we might shake our heads in amazement that such ideas were ever entertained, right? Or we might give into the temptation to ridicule them with smirks and laughter, as I'm sure you're all tempted to do while I was reading through this here. Right? You react the same way we think of medieval witchcraft and, 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 and so on. But one has to remember that in his own day, which is not that long ago, no, his own day, uh, <clears throat> Le Bon's racial scientism was mainstream. Le Bon had a significant impact on French political and military thought before World War I. Mussolini, Hitler, even Theodore Roosevelt studied Le Bon. And in my own work, I know that for the first half of the 20th century, just right up through the Korean War, yeah, US military thought, policies, and practices explicitly embodied Le Bon's work and ideas on racial crowds. That's fairly recent. People still are. Ideas and theories do matter and can have monumental consequences, especially when clothed in the validity and authority of science. In this regard, the law should stand as a cautionary historical example of our own time. We too might be in danger of the realization of what historian A.J.P. Taylor said of Napoleon III. He learned from the mistakes of the past how to make new ones. <laughs> Despite their great discoveries and future promises, neuroscience, neuropsychology, I can put evolutionary psychology on the side because that probably 
there. Uh, they're, they're still in the scientific infancy. And thus, projecting social theories and policies or historical trajectories uh, on, on base of these is risky to say the least. This is particularly the case when it is done with such confidence that somehow this will lead in a positive social direction. Does anyone really know where the discoveries of neuroscience will actually culminate? Or what it might reveal about the neurological foundations and impetus for group behavior? So much that seems to be speculative. Might it not possibly indicate that distinctive human groupings are neurologically prompted toward mutual group hostility as opposed to mutual affinity and interest as a species? Or might social policy, based upon a premature or dubious speculative interpretation of supposed scientific evidence, be so misguided that it leads to a modern version of crowd psychology you know, in either a progressive or atavistic version? Indeed, the positive outlooks on what this might mean for humanity are generally conceived of in terms of the, the framework of the Western <coughs> tradition. However, such science will undoubtedly likewise be invoked and then utilized by regimes in China, Russia, and similar non-liberal democratic states. They will, more likely than not, promote and legitimize social policies from which Western advocates of progressive hopes of neuroscience would recoil. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to respond to your beginning about the deference to science um, and to note that, uh, of course, I, the, first, the first half of my paper is about wisdom traditions. Mm -hmm. And the focus on the second half of my paper, I would say, is a symptom of an undue and mistake, our own undue and mistaken focus on science. If you listen to both parts of my paper and hear only the last, that itself is a symptom of our undue um, focus on science. And in my own work, as you know, yes. I'm, looking, uh, I, I'm looking at relationality, mutualism, as a framework for public policy. Science may turn out, or any particular finding in science, may over time turn out to be wrong or right and subject to continual modification. Um, everything we know today will not turn out to be accurate or true or what we can use, but everything may not turn out to be false either. And that's a question for um, time. Uh, but uh, bottom line, the, um, uh, the, the basis, at least in my work for public policy, is the framework of relationality. Science may turn out to help us illuminate that or not. So the emphasis is that way, not to begin with science. And that's why I put the wisdom traditions, whether you take them theistically or not, at the beginning. OK, one more, and then we'll move on to the final paper. The Bowen is writing at this time of a pretty radical uh, change in the ability of people to communicate rapidly over large amounts of space and move over large amounts of space quickly and efficiently with new technologies, right? Did he have a lot to say about the impact of communications and transportation technologies on either dissolving or enhancing the impact of the national crowd as an idea? No. OK, well, that's what I keep up to recall. Yeah. It seems to yeah. echo like contemporary technology. You no, know, I went back and reread it. That's not, that's not his orientation. OK, I think we're going to move on to David's paper. And then we still have time at the end. So, uh, next paper is by David Pound of the University of California, Irvine, it's on state sovereignty and trade. Thank you, Adrian. Um, thank you to my fellow panelists um, and um, the very stimulating talks. I um, wanted a little bit have a little less of a you know, philosophical focus, and I guess it's a more practical in mind. Okay. So, uh, since the crisis of the welfare state, has arisen because society has lost power in relation to the state. The key issue in evaluating the welfare state and its alternatives is the relationship between state structure and social order. While libertarian and anarchist solutions seek to 
to reduce the state for bare minimum. Such solutions fail to address the question of state sovereignty, preferring to assume that the idea of sovereignty is itself a problem. But to the extent that human order requires political decisions about the character of such order, the issue of sovereignty cannot be avoided. The state cannot be a neutral entity because human order is not neutral, but always implies a particular tradition and history that sets the parameters for order. The resulting diversity of human orders results in the diversity of states. And the abdication of the state's role in establishing a structure of human order would lead eventually not to the receding of the state in favor of society, but to, but to the subjugation to another state's sovereignty. Yet the ineradicability of sovereignty, and thus of the political, does not mean that the state must be a welfare state. In fact, the welfare state, in its attempt to manage social issues, has tended to undermine structures of mutual aid and thus of affective bonds that link people together. By making aid for others a matter of law, the state reduces the role of affect in the providing of aid. The consequence has been a gradual disintegration of affective bonds and voluntary structures that create the fabric of community, of community life. The welfare state's takeover of the structures of social bonds leads to the need to reduce the scope of state activity in order to allow for structures of mutual aid to develop. Yet the task is not simply the the, the, the task is not simply uh, to dismantle the state. State order, in fact, will always provide the context of order within which structures of mutual aid can develop. Such community structures, though they must develop in some sense organically as a result of voluntary interactions, still exist within a framework of state sovereignty that will guarantee the context and set the parameters of their development. <coughs> the promotion of mutual aid does not depend simply on the receding of the state, but rather a redesign of state structures in order to specifically foster kinds of community structures um, that would promote mutual aid. The issue is not just one of more state versus less state. Such a binary outlook has driven us to the choice between the two bad alternatives of an increasingly invasive welfare state and a laissez-faire state that abandons all responsibility for the consequences of its structures. Rather than thinking about the question of mutual aid as a problem of more or less state, we must begin to think about the specific character of different models of state structure and the ways that state structure affect the development of community structures and mutual aid. Charles Murray undertakes this type of project in his book, In Our Hands, in 2004 which begins with the idea that the true goal of state structure is to create the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. Here he defines happiness as composed of five basic elements, the first two of which, fulfillment of basic needs and security, are preconditions of happiness, and the next three, meaningful intimate relationships, vocation, and self-respect, really make up the substance of happiness. But if the welfare state is designed to guarantee the fulfillment of basic needs for everyone, it fails to directly address the three substantive issues. He argues, in fact, that the welfare state undermines these sources of happiness by taking over the responsibilities um, <clears throat> where individual initiative could be employed to solve problems. The welfare state's shouldering of such responsibilities takes away from society the kinds of interactions that establish human bonds and make life meaningful. He, fo he focuses, for example, on the issue of unwed mothers in the underclass and indicates that when welfare benefits are tied to the number of children a mother has, the role of fathers has been replaced by a state bureaucracy. On the one hand, the state provision of, of benefits for children takes away the voluntary aspect of this provision and turns the basis of a human bond into a mechanical bureaucratic operation. On the other hand, in replacing the fathers that would otherwise be providing for children, such a system gradually erodes the institution of marriage and the long-term forms of intimacy linked to it. The fulfillment of basic needs is consequently not just a precondition of happiness that can come from anywhere. Rather, fulfilling such basic needs for each other is part of what makes the substance of makes up the substance of human relationships. The mother's and father's care for a child are, of course, expressions of love that are integral to establishing family bonds. Part of the source of the intimacy is the sense that they are the parents are in a unique position to provide such care. If the state plays the role of the father as a provider of basic needs, a source of intimacy has been removed from the relationship between father and child, as well as between father and mother. 
If such a view seems to reflect gender stereotypes, it also reflects the fact that in cases of children born out of wedlock, it is still generally the mother who is left with the baby. This dynamic where the provision of basic needs creates the basis of social bonds is also the case for community life. If self-respect is a basic aspect of happiness, people also need a social contact with which, within which they can develop it. That is, they need to have the opportunity to interact with others and make decisions in accordance with one's sense of what is proper behavior toward those others. Part of these decisions are those that affect other people's lives and needs. Once the state takes over such decisions and enshrines them in laws and bureaucracies, the provisioning of needs is no longer a voluntary decision that creates the basis for self-respect. A valid response to this view of the way the welfare states under a valid response to this view of the way in which the welfare state undermines community structures of mutual aid is that the dissolution of the welfare state would lead to a situation of precarity in which such needs would simply not be met. The long-term perspective here is that as the state recedes, voluntary associations will naturally develop to provide such needs in a way that links their provisioning with the development of social bonds. But in fact, um, uh, Murray is not satisfied um, with this uh, libertarian solution, but in fact he argues that we need not depend on this kind of logic in dismantling the welfare state. Rather, he imagines a model of a universal basic income that will replace the welfare state um, and create a merging of libertarian ideals with the desire to maintain a social safety net. But beyond the goal of reconciling libertarianism with social democracy, Murray lays out a model of thinking about the state that recognizes the way in which state structure in either a maximal or minimal state will always have profound effects on human behavior and the development of community structures. He begins with the basic conservative truth that welfare state programs, such as food stamps, Section 8 housing, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, create a set of incentives for behavior that have broad negative effects on community development and order. In looking at self welfare state programs, he attempts to think through those effects on families and communities in order to redesign them with the goal of mutual aid in mind. The solution is to eliminate all of those programs and replace them with a universal basic income. He calculates that the savings in both the funds dispersed as well as the elimination of the bureaucracies set up to manage disbursements and police eligibility requirements will be enough to provide a universal basic income of $10,000 per year in 2002 dollars to every citizen at least 21 years of age or older, assuming that this basic income would gradually be reduced to $5,000 when that individual's other income goes from $25,000 to $50,000 per year. While this calculation recognizes our economy's wealth and its consequent, uh, consequent ability to provide such universal basic income, the more important aspect of his plan consists of the structuring of such income in such a way that it promotes the kind of community development and mutual aid that he would like to see. One of the key goals that he cites is the building and buttressing of family bonds and structures. A key problem with the current welfare state that he sees is that its programs are often based on the need to limit one's income in order to be eligible for benefits such as food stamps or Section 8 housing. These requirements not only create a counterproductive incentive to limit or hide income, they also create a sense of stigma against those who take advantage of such benefits. His design of a, use of a universal basic income avoids these problems first by making the basic income universal, thus eliminating any stigma, since all receive the benefit. And second, by creating a high income, a high income threshold to begin phasing out the basic income. In his model, uh, the universal basic income only begins to phase out when someone reaches an income, uh, uh, an earned income of $25,000 per year, apart from this universal basic income. Even at that point, it does not phase out immediately. Rather, each dollar of additional income above $25,000 per year reduces the universal basic income by 20 cents. The structuring of universal basic income consequently does not create an incentive to avoid or hide work. Any income up to $25,000 per year is gained in addition to the universal basic income. Each dollar of earn earned above $25,000 per year does reduce that um, uh, universal income, but at such a slow rate that it still makes economic sense for an individual to earn this extra money. In addition to the incentive to earn income aside 
uh, in addition to the universal basic income, Murray's model creates incentives to take responsibility for one's actions in other ways. One of Murray's key goals is to, is to promote the maintenance of family structures. As he points out, uh, one of the failings of the current welfare state system is that it promotes the erosion of family structures through, through its incentives. He has carefully planned to think through the specific policies that would, pr that would promote family bonds. Here, a key aspect is that the payment of the, of the universal basic income in this plan only begins when one turns 21. This is important because it requires everyone to bridge the gap between the end of high school and the start of the universal basic income, either through college or through a job. This requirement makes it important that young people develop a habit of study or work in those early years. In addition, the ability to earn an income that might amount to $20,000 a year by the time the universal uh, basic income begins will provide an incentive to keep on working and still also receive um, the universal basic in addition to wages or it provides the ability at that point to stop working in order to pursue education or the development of a new vocation. The goal here is to provide to all segments of the population the kind of freedom to follow one's own path that is generally reserved for the wealthy, while also encouraging work as a way of finding this path. Moreover, Murray stipulates that the universal basic income would be tied to a passport and to a bank account into which a monthly payment would be automatically made by the government. In this way, everyone knows that everyone else receives this basic income. This knowledge is crucial in restructuring social relationships because suddenly everyone now has a stake in society in the sense that everyone is now a rentier. Because everyone, no matter what their background, background is can look forward to the universal basic income, everyone can be expected to contribute to society. On a basic level, he, he points out there would no longer be any deadbeat fathers because every father is known to have presently or in the near future a monthly income going into a known bank account that can be tapped to provide child support. Yet precisely this state um, that all fathers would have will become something that potential fathers will want to protect, encouraging them to be therefore more responsible in their relations with women. Their stake in society now becomes something that they in, are interested in in protecting and preserving. These examples demonstrate the way in which Murray's plan is not primarily about providing for basic needs, though this is a side effect of his plan. Rather, the focus is on promoting the kinds of interactions that will lead to individual happiness through the development of social relationships. In this way, the role of the state would not be to simply provide for basic needs, but rather to provide the context within which communities, within which communities can develop and flourish. The key to this project is to allow individuals to make decisions about their lives that will have substantive consequences. Developing such a context is not, context is not just a result of small group relations, but also of the structuring of state sovereignty. Okay. Okay, questions to David in the first instance, and then to other panelists. Well, are there any questions for David's paper? Yes, please go ahead. Hi. If you could also maybe mention I'm your Adana. name. Yeah, thanks. So, thank you for your paper. The problem I have with your paper is that um, uh, what happens when people who receive $10,000 they look around and they see all the inequality, all the gaps, and they have $10,000. And what can you do with $10,000 a year? I, I don't know. If I were in New York City with ten thousand dollars, um, I, I don't know what I would do with that. And the idea that that encourages me to enter in long-term relationships with my ten thousand dollars. So what I see here is pacifying people, and I see a lot of discussion about dignity, but I don't see myself being empowered to have dignity. I love the idea of helping fathers, men, um, becoming more prevalent in their children's lives. But uh, at the same time, I, I, I really want some solutions. And uh, with Murray, I don't know his work. Thank you for pointing that out. I would like to see how I can uh, use it. But uh, that's my question for you. How, how do you feel about these solutions which are not systemic, not taking into consideration where we are going with our capitalism? with our rampant capitalism, what I see here is a destruction 
and uh, our solutions are, okay, let's try to be happy with our $10,000. I, I can't survive with $10,000. Maybe if I go back to the name. Uh, <coughs> okay, let me take the second question for David as well. <coughs> sure, yeah, uh, I'm uh, Chet, um, uh, and um, I guess I had sort of a related question, which was if um, Murray reconciles, so the, or, or how he kind of deals with this 21 year, like when you're 21 is when the mutual aid kicks in, and so that one would be encouraged to work or study, um, and that would strengthen family bonds. But what about individuals who are rejected by their families? Like, um, for any number of reasons, um, that an individual might be rejected by their family. Does, does he sort of provide a response to that, or? Okay, so David, you both. So, um, so I think the focus here is not so much on um, specific solutions that we're going to be providing to people, but rather, um, and, and, and for covering all of their needs, right? Rather, the idea is that you're going to be providing everybody with kind of you know, this universal basis right, with which to kind of start their lives and continue their lives. And, and that's kind of the, it's, it's a replacement for the current social safety net. Right? Um, but, the, but the focus of it is not so much the safety net, even though it, you know, he calculates that the, the amount that, of aid that you'd be getting, this is $2,002, so if it was like $2,020, I'd probably have to like maybe probably $14,000 a year. Right? And so uh, the idea is that that amount is actually pretty much equivalent or more than the most that anybody would get in welfare benefits through all these other programs, right? Whatever, you know, the uh, food stamps and aid, what was it? Second aid. Uh, right, yeah, it used to be called aid to family and yeah. children, but there's a new way to work. Yeah, anyway, and so he calculates all it. It's actually more than people would be getting. And in fact, it's probably more than people would be getting with, with Social Security for the most part as well, right? And so you can replace all these programs with just this very simple solution, no bureaucracy, but, and it doesn't provide any answers to specific social questions, but it basically leaves it to people to figure it out themselves. Look, you, we're, we're, we're t telling people, here's the money, do with it what you want. Right? You've got a problem, here's the money to solve it, and here's, it's not, it's going to have to solve everything, but it kind of provides you with a kind of a, a baseline, a floor, from which to kind of go out and seek out other solutions. Because obviously people can work and earn money in order to provide, get more money than that, right? But it provides a baseline, and, and precisely for people that, whose family rejects them, they still get the universal basic, basic yeah, income as an individual. It a baseline. If we're all at the baseline, I mean, you're going to give this person, if you're giving everybody the same amount. Everybody gets the same amount. That's ridiculous. Because uh, next door, I mean, I grew up in Park Slope. What was interesting when I grew up in Park Slope is everybody lived next to each other. You had black, you had white, you had rich, you had poor. You know? and. You know, the kids I grew up with had a lot of money. I never realized that until recently. That's not a level thing. If I'm getting $2,000 and they're getting $2,000, but they already have $7 million that their grandmother gave them when they was born, just to give it to them, not to mention the money that they're going to get when she drops dead, not to mention the money they're going to get when the fuck. Mm -hmm. I have friends that have inherited and they're never coming back to park. So three or four brownstones, now that we're old and our parents are dropping dead. So I don't see how giving everybody the same amount of money creates any chance for anybody. Okay. So David, if you want to respond to there's another one. Is that to David as well? Yes. Okay, fine. Let's take that question, then we'll open up. Oh, we're there more? Okay. So, okay. so uh, David? Oh. The, so the objective is to reduce the uh, amount of, of bureaucratic administration necessary to provide what the welfare state currently does. In a way, that's part of the uh, way it's implemented. Um, but um, would that would there not be uh, another bureaucratic apparatus required to ensure that the market doesn't just capture this additional money, right? That that um, uh, rent and other necessities aren't just immediately uh, don't just sort of 
take that movie right away and leave people where they were to begin with. Um, would that not require some administrative apparatus to regulate? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, what's, uh, what's that? Oh, I'm Anna. I'm Anna Keller from right. Kentucky. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, I live on uh, nine thousand dollars a year from a Pell Grant in a small town in Kentucky, plus uh, food stamps, and uh, it's it's very hard. It's very hard. Um, I wanted to say uh, that Charles Murray um, has done bad genetics, and he's done bad economics. And even if he's done good social science, like it's hard to trust when he moves into a field in which he doesn't necessarily have expertise. Um, it sounds like this program's means tested for one thing, which means you need to have a bureaucracy to ensure that we know people's income. So when their income increases above $25,000, they get a lower cash payment. It sounds like maybe during moments of expansion of the private economy, people will be flushed into the UBI program, and during contraction, they'd re-enter the private sector, but I'm not quite sure how that counter-cyclical movement works and what kind of a hit that takes for somebody who loses a higher paying job. Um, right now, people up to $100,000 a year are often living paycheck to paycheck because a lot of where um, uh, inequality comes from is it comes from the rent that's taxed on various parts of our life, you know, car loans, education, uh, credit card debt. Right now, subprime uh, car loans are a huge product that's being flushed into pensions all over the place. So they're hot, hot, hot everywhere. The minute everybody's got a certain amount of money, of course, there's going to be capture of that money. It feels to me like this program is sort of a neo-feudal program, you know, um, my, my, uh, my income is paid out of the endowment of the college I go to, which is a billion dollars. Bloomberg's spending that much out of his pocket on his presidential campaign, right? So, so it, this program doesn't seem to deal with a lot of the structural issues in our society in the way that like a jobs guarantee program or something aimed in promoting industrial democracy might do, which would be something that Murray would Murray and the American Enterprise Institute would rebel against intensely. Okay. So that's my Thank you very much. So, argument. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's really fast. Yeah, it's the other Okay, well. go ahead. Um, so just, just Sarah, hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, David gave the presentation. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have to apologize. Yeah, I yeah, know. So uh, my question, too, is, uh, is to this question of capture. Um, right, so we have, like, payments, right, your rent could go, whatever. But we live in a city where not everybody's a citizen, right? So if we have $10,000 fundamentally attached to a passport, and then like your rent goes up because your landlord automatically assumes, oh, you've got $10,000 more to spend, right? I can jack the rent up. This isn't a you know, rent control, right? And so then how does that contribute to making social life more unlivable for those of us that are undocumented? Okay, so David, a uh, few minutes to respond to all these questions, <laughs> questions so, comments, and objections, and we'll open up to other questions. Right. Right. I, will, I, will, I, will, I will just kind of repeat what I said before. In that, um, <laughs> 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 in, 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 in order to find out that the plan, this plan that he developed, um, really um, is not focused on. Um, you know, pro providing for everything, right? It's not a, 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 it's like a blanket solution for all social problems, but the, it, it's based on the sort of theory of mutual aid in the, se in the sense that it, it's based on this theory that once you've given this money to people to do what they want with it um, and not put any strings on it, no kind of provisions, no, no other safety nets other than the, the, you know, the, the, the universal basic income, uh, it allows people to make choices about things and um, to develop their own solutions. And it might be market-based solutions, right? So, you know, I'm not going to go into it, but he has a whole other section about health insurance and how to deal with health insurance. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. But, but except to say that, he, you know, he's imagining a kind of new market for different modes of health insurance that would, that would be more similar to the way you kind of take care of your car, right? Where you kind of like, you pay for routine maintenance out of your own budget, and then you, you get insurance for the you know, catastrophic 
you know, cases, right? Um, and that you, you would, you know, you, things would develop within the society that would meet those types of needs because people have money to spend on those different needs. And, and the idea is not to create these sort of um, prefabricated solutions for people, but, you know, uh, provide these resources to people to, to make their own solutions to the, to the problems they develop, and, and therefore promote this idea of mutual aid and promote um, kind of meaningful social interaction. Okay, that's a general answer, so I'm not, I'm not addressing the specific issues, just as long as this is the way I approach this question. Okay, uh, I have a question from Marcia, who likes to share this question as well. Uh, in the Bible, of course, there's both pain and able. Uh, and to simply focus on agricultural societies as the outcome of the transition, uh, when in fact pastoral societies, which are renowned for their social solidarity, um, it, and that social solidarity, of course, is manifested in their capacity for reigning, for conquering, etc., uh, etc. Et in fact, there's a, there's a long history of pastoral civilization in Eurasia right up to the 18th century. So one of the advantages of social solidarity seems to me to make war. Um, and that's also true of democratic societies. One can look at ancient Athens, uh, the first democratic societies. What democracy did was to increase their capacity to make war. So one of the things about social solidarity and coming together, in fact, may not have anything to do with peace, but in fact encourages the aggressive capacity in human beings. And so there's a, there's a and, and I think that's recognized in the, mm -hmm. in the Bible, that they're both pastoral and, and agricultural people. So, um, okay, so. <coughs> it's also for you, so you can sort of just add more, add more to it. And it's sort of a, a vague, amorphous question, but what your talk put me in the mind of a great deal is Hobbes, who also has a strong emphasis <coughs> on a covenantal system that ensures relationships and on the ubiquity of fear as the powerful motive for that covenant, where you discuss sort of the transition into societies that have significant surplus and fear. Um, so it's more a request for you to riff a little bit um, on whether you see the elements of Hobbes uh, in your discussion of covenantalism. Okay, Marsha and Joe, and then maybe Wayne for any final thoughts. Do you want me to respond? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Yes, so um, the Bible is post-centrism, post-agrarianism, and post-herding. And so it is reflecting um, that which pertains to those societies. Um, uh, so when we speak of pastoral societies, um, we have to distinguish between life before when we had mobile foreign foragers with very rare and usually no accumulated surpluses. Peter Kapler has a wonderful line, of, uh, uh, but I don't have the quote either of you exactly here, that um, mo mobile, mobile foragers um, don't accumulate goods, share what they have, whereas any form of herding, sedentarism and agriculture, accumulate goods, do not rely on hyper -co or on cooperativity, and take what um, they can with force. So it, you're quite right to raise the pastoral, the herding um, mode of uh, food attainment. Um, but the distinction made still in the literature is what happened about 8,000 BCE? And the rule in, in evolutionary biology and biology in general is when there's a radical change in behavior, it has to be accounted for. Uh, so. Um, the, pers the persuasive argument today is that sedentary and agriculture, which included herding between 8,000 and 6,000 BC as it developed, uh, um, as it developed. Um, uh, but that needs to be distinguished between mobile foragers who had none of that, neither sedentarism, nor herding, nor accumulated agricultural surpluses. And we can talk more about that, but just to sketch out what the basic um, distinctions um, are. Um, so Hobbes, um, there are many uh, discussions of covenant over the millennia, and they are not all the same. 
Um, we know, for example, that comment was part of the US legal system uh, until the 1964 Civil Rights Act as a legal agreement among persons to exclude usually blacks and Jews from buying real estate in their neighborhood. And that was called covenant. Mm -hmm. So the word covenant has been used in a wide variety um, of meanings and contexts. So um, I am using relational, reciprocal, and mutually constitutive notions of covenant to illuminate relationality. Um, Hobbes's focus on fear is already what the biologists would call a post-agrarian sedentarism and so on um, worldview. And Hobbes's writing on fear is terrific. He's, he's not only, uh, he, he's a very good psychologist in addition to the other things that, um, that he is. Um, but I'm not using um, his ruminations on covenant um, because I'm um, explicitly and transparently looking at things like Trinity, Eucharist, Covenant um, in their relational modalities to illuminate relationality. I'm not doing, for example, an annotated bibliography of all possible uses of Covenant, <laughs> right? So, um, so that's how my work goes, right? I'm, I'm looking for things that illuminate reciprocity and mutual constitution as a framework for public policy. Joe and then Wayne. I'm not going to talk about the Bible. Right? <laughs> I'll probably too to that. But my problem with so much of this is that it's highly speculative, right? We're talking about prehistoric times, right? No written records, pastoral societies, various societies, integration, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that what we have now, currently, the last several decades, so there's this sort of type of science here. There's a certain like attitude, yeah. uh, now, a very positive attitude, uh, one that is uh, contrary to all the theories of aggression and all of that. It's really strikes this kind of wishful thinking, right? Uh, and I, and I, I say this because uh, I spent a good many years going through the scientific literature of the late 19th century. And I can take you down the aisle of the library where the journals are, the anthropology journals and so on and so forth, and pull them off where they talk about, in many respects, the exact same time period, right? The exact same events, except that they see it in terms of, right? This naturalistic aggression and so on and so forth, and survival of this and all of that. It's just as speculative then as it is now. The difference is that I think that if they were reflecting a particular mentality of their age, and now we're projecting the kind of wishful thinking. I don't see that uh, any of these are any more concretely scientific uh, stuff. Okay, Wayne, for some final thoughts. I think I probably agree with David. I don't, I haven't read Murray, and I don't think I like what Murray seems to say. But I do agree very much with David that this whole conference needs to pay attention to what actual arrangements can be put in place, what actual organizational forms can be developed, and what's wrong with the ones we've got now. Because when you go to any conference in the world and people attack capitalism or inequality or social injustice or domination, it's all lovely. You've heard it all before and you've even read the boring books they've just read for the first time. But it doesn't actually help a single child or a single old person. Now, my view of the United States, as David and other people you know, is very favorable, but not to your institutions. I think you've got the worst institutions in the world, not only a dreadful political system, but a dreadful medical system, a dreadful legal system. And I say that because I come from a country that has good ones, and the gap is simply <laughs> enormous between the mess you see here and a country that actually knows how to do it. Well, we don't have this rubbish of 10,000 homeless people on the streets of San Diego, or masses of old people are being carted off to gambler casinos, or young people being given porn because it makes money for the people who provide the porn. So I want to say we have a much more <laughs> radical approach. We have to get rid of this rotten system in the United States. No one in the world will want it now. After Trump, the whole world, particularly in Asia, is sitting down and saying, we won't follow the American film. We have to hear that. That's what is being said by the bankers of Asia not, and the generals of Asia, let alone in China. And it's very important because they're right. If you produce this, no one will follow you into the film. They will go the other way. So if you want a better society, you have to have better institutions, better arrangements. I agree strongly with David. It's not a matter of, though, I gave you grand philosophical buck. That's not what it's about at this level. At a higher level it is, and this comes back to Marcy's correct point, because if you want a better institution, 
you have to bring in the subjectivity of the human being into how it works. Because otherwise you're going to create the mess of East Germany and the mess of the Soviet Union and the mess of all of the socialist countries that tried to do very good things that produced horrible. If you don't want horrible, you must put the transcendental nature of the human being in the organizational form. So I very strongly with David. I apologize for my incompetent remarks to Marcia. I sympathize with the whole direction of her thought on covenant. And I think we've got a realist among us, and I'm very grateful. For that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just make one point, Wayne. There are homeless sleeping out in the streets of Melbourne and Sydney. Yes, absolutely. They're not in the numbers of the United I States. Don't know by a factor of 5,000 to 1. 5,000 to 1. We have all the same problems. We haven't done nothing about it like the United States. Okay, I think we'll carry on the conversation about Australia and other countries. <laughs> 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 <laughs>